celebrates Amtrak DART's final milestones. We'll see two astronauts demonstrate what kinetic impact looks like in space, and we'll go behind the scenes at one of the observatories following DART's impact from Earth. You can participate in today's show tonight by submitting questions for our experts to answer live on air. Drop them into the stream wherever you're watching or use the hashtag Planetary Defender on social media. Now we're a little over 70 minutes out from impact at 7.14 p.m. Let's now meet your co-host, Samson Rainey, joining us live from the Mission Operations Center. Samson, it's good to see you. How does it feel to be in the middle of the action tonight? Hey, Tahira, I am feeling great. It is awesome to be back here after co-hosting Dart's launch just 10 short months ago. How's the energy over there? Wow, that's amazing, Samson. You know, everybody's super excited. I've been talking to some scientists and engineers before the show, and it's really just anticipation about what's going to happen tonight. So with that, could you give us an update on how things are going with mission operations? I'm glad you're enjoying it there. This is going to be fun. So I mentioned launch, right? It was a huge event. NASA launches have become a staple of life for space aficionados. But there's never been anything like what we're about to see tonight, an attempt to impact an asteroid in near real time, the first attempt to change the motion of a celestial body. Just wow. If we hit that asteroid, Tahira, I think we're going to see a whole new side of this team that we've never seen before. Because let me tell you, since launch, these engineers and scientists have been eating, sleeping, and breathing this mission. This center has been like a second home for them as they've been monitoring the spacecraft's health and managing everything from propulsion to the power supply, guidance and navigation, the list goes on and on. They've run countless simulations and have rehearsed for this moment time and time again, preparing for anything, and I mean anything that could possibly happen. A quick recap of the last 24 hours, no surprise here, they've been busy. Last night, they performed the sixth and last of what are called trajectory correction maneuvers to aim DART to within 200 meters of Didymos. Then they worked straight through to this morning to make sure that all went smoothly. Then they soldiered on to get us ready for tonight. And here we are, about an hour and 10 minutes from impact, and we're now in what's called the terminal phase, meaning that SmartNav, the autonomous navigation system, is actively guiding the spacecraft as it was designed to do for its final four hours. I also received word minutes ago that DART has reached another critical milestone. Draco, the eyes of SmartNav, is able to detect Dimorphos. This is a major goalpost, I have to remind you, because up until now, Draco has only been able to detect Didymos, the much larger asteroid it orbits. The next major milestone we're waiting for is for SmartNav to be locked on or targeting Dimorphos. We'll get more into what that means later. Lots more to come as we draw closer to impact. Back to you, Tahira. All right. Thank you, Samson. It feels good to know that we are detecting Dimorphos. Now, before we get any closer to impact, let's get to know our spacecraft and its mission. After a beautiful launch from Vandenberg Space Force Base on November 24, 2021, DART has traveled over 400 million miles. And now, in just over an hour, we'll witness the spacecraft collide with asteroid Dimorphos in an attempt to change its orbit forever. The DART spacecraft is about the size of a vending machine and uses hydrazine thrusters for propulsion and roll out solar arrays for power. At about DART is on a collision course with asteroid Dimorphos, which is about the height of the Washington Monument and, more importantly, poses no threat to Earth. Dimorphos sits within a double asteroid system and is the smaller moonlit asteroid orbiting its larger companion Didymos. DART has just one instrument on board, and that's a Draco camera, which is feeding images to its autonomous navigation system, steering it straight into the asteroid. Now, teams from around the world have worked hard to get us to this moment. Samson is standing by with NASA's head of science and Johns Hopkins, APL's head of space exploration. Let's check in to hear more about the journey. Thanks, Tahira. To help give us some insight into what it takes to imagine, much less attempt a mission this ambitious, I have with me Thomas Urbukin, Associate Administrator for NASA's Science Mission Directorate, and Bobby Braun, Space Exploration Sector Head at Johns Hopkins APL. Thanks. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, Thomas, I'll start with you. The mission, this team has been through an intense journey, years in the making, and they are now on the cusp of doing the seemingly impossible, um, impacting a tiny asteroid 7 million miles away from Earth with a spacecraft traveling 14,000 miles per hour. 
why is it important for us to continue to push the boundaries of what's possible in space? You know, uh, what I always think is the world is made out of a box. Those are things we know that we can use and a large space of things that are unknown. In that large space are solutions for problems of the future. There's new research, new understanding of nature. And we at NASA, we're all about moving that boundary back, moving it back to make more things useful for us, like DART, but also understanding nature in a new fashion. That's incredible, Thomas. Well, based on what we know tonight heading into this main event, you know, what are, what are you thinking about our chances of impact? Oh, I'm betting on the team. Betting on the team is always the right thing to do when it comes to NASA missions, whether it's this one or other teams we've had. The thing you just announced, you know, that kind of seeing that little bump there in, uh, in the image of that new kind of celestial body we knew was there, but uh, now we have uh, have it on the camera. It's just, uh, just a step in that direction. I'm very optimistic. That's awesome. What the team has planned for months, years ago is coming to fruition, and we're watching it live. Absolutely. It's just exciting. Awesome. Thank you, Thomas. Bobby, you've been through so many white knuckle experiences um, with space missions, most recently with the landing of the Mars Perseverance rover just last year. Mm -hmm. um, what is the mindset of the team coming to such a major moment in their career with the stakes being so high? Well, teams like this prepare for the worst, but celebrate the best. And I think we're going to have one of those best nights tonight. There are, of course, many things that could go wrong in spaceflight, but so far this team has been on top of every possible problem. They've been ahead of it, and they just need to focus and, and push through and go for success. That's awesome. I think from what we're hearing, the cheers coming out of the mock um, before this broadcast, I feel like we're on the right track. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Any pep talk or advice for the team heading into tonight that you gave them? Well, I've been in the mock several times today talking with the team. Um, they're calm, they're cool, they're collected. I basically told them, just follow the data, trust in each other, trust in themselves. You know, they've prepared for this moment for years, mm -hmm. and so they know this better than anybody. And as a team, they're going to get through this successfully. That is awesome. Thank you both. That's great words of wisdom for moving forward in space, and it seems like the team is in good hands with themselves. All right, Tahira, we're attempting the once unthinkable, but the team has prepared for this moment now to keep a steady course on this last mission-defining leg. Back to you. All right, thanks, Samson. I mean, it is incredible what the teams are pulling off tonight. This is a first of its kind mission, testing a way to one day save our planet from a hazardous asteroid. Now, we asked astronauts aboard the International Space Station to show us how this technique works in microgravity, and they had some fun with it. Now, before we get to the video, I urge you to keep a close eye on Shane. He's gonna be in the blue shirt and standing in for asteroid Dimorphos. A white object is about to come crashing into him. That's our spacecraft. You'll notice how the impact of the crash moves Shane's position in space. This demo, much like DART's test, relies on the energy transfer from a collision to change the motion of an object. The method, which is called kinetic impact deflection, is the technique DART will test at 7.14 p.m. Eastern. Let's take a look. So what I'll do, Shane's going to be the asteroid, um, and I'm going to be the NASA DART mission. Well, this CTV, more exactly, is going to be a spacecraft. Um, I'm going to try to throw it, and we'll look at the effect of that mass coming at him and the kinetic energy transfer from the CTB to Shane. Shane will be perfectly stable. <laughs> it's not an easy test. You ready? All right, here it comes. <laughs> I've redirected Shane successfully. <laughs> Pretty good. All right. Now back on Earth, we're taking your questions live in just a few minutes. Send them in using the hashtag Planetary Defender and stand by. It's time now for our first status poll update. Let's head to Samson to check in on DART's progress. Samson, how are we looking? Hey Tahira, we are entering the 60 minute mark until impact and as you noted, the team is about to conduct a poll which is essentially a status update to check that key systems are in working order. We're talking Draco image quality, smart nav, guidance and navigation, ground systems performance, everything that's anything to do with getting us to impact. 
All right, I think the poll is about to get underway. Let's start to listen in. We are waiting for that poll to begin any second now. Martin Evelyn off console. Waiting on that first poll of the evening. There will be two polls, one at 60 minutes, which is now, and one at 30 minutes. Afterward, we should be hearing from Elena Adams, the mission systems engineer to give us a summary of what we have just heard. All right, folks, we're an hour prior to impact. Woohoo! And we're seeing Demorphous. So wonderful, wonderful. All right, let's do our poll. Um, Image quality? Let's start with you. Oh, Images sure. are looking great. Uh, Dimorphos is coming in at about the same relative dimness as Didymos, so very consistent brightness between the two. And it's a stable track. That's awesome. All right, uh, SmartNav? SmartNav is looking good. We're sitting at about 30 meters of uh, projected mist distance. There is no movement right now on the bars for doing a maneuver, but we do expect that when we transition uh, in about 10 minutes that we'll see a maneuver at that point. Yeah, that's great. And at this point, because we have a stable track, we do expect to transition over that at that correct. time. So that's really good. Whew, that's good. All right, GNC. <clears throat> GNC is nominal. We're, we're ready to burn. <laughs> that that sounds good too. And maneuver. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Autonomy. Autonomy is nominal. Heaters are cycling, and no more fault rules. All right. DSN. DSN looks good. And we don't see any sign of rain. And ESA looks good as well. That's good. And then ground system. Ground system is nominal, and we have a clear vision of Dimorphos on the image display now. Yes, it looks great. Thank you, guys. All right, um, one more poll after this, but in the meantime, we're going to tr hopefully transition at 15 minutes to locking. So stand by. All right, we're going to hear from Lena ourselves to give us a update. Hey, Lena. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. That sounded like a great poll. Any words about what we just heard? Oh, um, we're very excited. Uh, we are starting to see Demorphos for the first time. It is uh, looking great. Um, it is um, just about the same dimness as Didymos, as we expected. And so we are getting ready to transition. We have a stable track at this point. It's about... Um, seven pixels in size and uh yeah we're ready to go it's great news lena thanks so much i'll let you get back to it thank you wow that that was that's a great update joining me in reacting to that bit of news is angela stickle planetary geologist and a dart investigation team lead angela you just heard the poll you just heard lena things seem like they're going really well what are you feeling what are you thinking Oh, I'm so excited. This is fantastic. We can see Demorphos and 
We're on our way. Gosh. Basically, we just got to keep humming along, right? Right. It's awesome. Heading in. Gosh. Well, let's quickly talk about the next major milestone that's ahead of us, locking on target with Dimorphos, which could happen as early as 10 or so minutes from now. Right now, SmartNav is still targeting Didymos, right? But locking onto Dimorphos means, all right, Dimorphos, you are bright. You are consistently bright enough. I'm ready to start targeting you. Can you dive into what that means a little bit more? Yeah, exactly. So SmartNav is looking for bright parts of the image. And so as Dimorphos gets closer and it's brighter and bigger, um, SmartNav will just target onto it as opposed to Didymos, and we'll be on our way um, to impact. That is awesome. Thank you, Angela. That's very cool stuff. Good luck with the rest of the evening. Thank you. Great. And while we wait, we want to invite you to celebrate the life of an important member of our DART team. Pulling off extraordinary events requires extraordinary people. And Ray Harvey was just that, a leader, an engineer, a friend. Ray devoted his life to making the impossible possible. Tonight, we pay tribute to DART's former mission operations manager. Ray Harvey was our mission operations manager for DART, but I've known Ray since I've been at the lab, which is about 14 years. As a young engineer, having people like Ray was actually extremely important because you could go ask Ray a question. He would tell you a joke, but he would also give you an answer, so you didn't feel awkward asking questions. It, you would just feel good coming out with more knowledge, but also you had fun in the process. I've known Ray probably since I started working here almost 25 years ago. and. He was always like a good mentor and a sounding board for anything we were doing. I think everybody learned something from Ray, his leadership skills, how to treat people, how to work as a team. Ray was a pretty amazing person. Even though he was fighting this terrible disease, he made it a point to be involved in all the rehearsals and all the activities going on on DART. He led the mission operations team to the last few days of his life. He was really hoping to, to make it to the end of this mission. He meant so much to this team and to getting us to this point. It represents so many years of hard work of him and also the team, him leading that team. And so the DART spacecraft is a tribute to Ray. We are hoping that this experience kind of goes out to Ray and to his family. We will, we will really miss him, and we already miss him. Ray has touched so many lives. Even in the short time that I knew him, he was so generous with his knowledge, and he made you feel like you belonged. Ray, you will be greatly missed. This one's for you. Tahira. Thank you, Samson, for that beautiful dedication. Now, if you're just joining us, we're under an hour away from the DART spacecraft's head-on collision with asteroid Dimorphos. DART's mission is a test of a planetary defense technique that could one day save humanity. Rest assured, the test poses no threat to Earth. The spacecraft is almost 7 million miles away from us right now, and you're watching a live stream of its approach to Dimorphos. It takes about 45 seconds for the images you're seeing in the DART cam to make their way back to Earth. Any moment now, we should learn if DART is ready to commit to impact. While we wait, I'm here with Andy Rivkin, DART science investigation lead, and Mallory D. Coster, DART impact modeler. Andy, Mallory. While we wait to learn if DART is ready to commit to Dimorphos, I can't help but wonder, why this asteroid? That's a great question. The way that the double asteroid redirection test was designed, it was uh, to, to measure the period change in a binary asteroid system. So we needed a binary asteroid, so that eliminates some number of objects. Mm -hmm. We needed something uh, with a moon that was small enough that we could move it with uh, a an, uh, strike from a, from a spacecraft, mm -hmm. um, but not so small that we wrecked the, uh, the moon. So when you kind of tick off all the possibilities, Didymos really ended up as the best choice and really the only choice that would provide a mission in this time period. See, I want to go back to that. You mentioned having a moon that we could push but not destroy. 
Could you now in pop culture a lot, we see that, you know, oftentimes the idea is to just totally try to demolish the asteroid. Why have we chosen to not test that technique? Yeah, the conventional wisdom uh, for planetary defense is that you don't want to um, disrupt an object and blow it into a zillion pieces, but you want to keep it intact and just move it all as one piece. Because if you move it all in one piece, then you can keep track of it a lot easier. If you blow it into a million pieces, then some of them might still Earth, <laughs> and you don't want to miss a thing. Yeah, we might have more issues then. So we know that we have the perfect test subject. Mallory, now can you help us understand how, if mission success, um, DART's mission tonight can help improve models for mitigating hazardous asteroids in the future. That's exactly right. So we stand to learn a lot from this DART impact. DART is both a technology demonstration as well as a really big science experiment. So from a technology standpoint, we're going to see if we have what it takes to autonomously navigate a spacecraft into a relatively small celestial body, something the size of a, of a football stadium um, that's pretty far away from Earth. Um, from a science perspective, we get to perform one of the largest and fastest impact experiments that man has done, something yeah. <laughs> that could never be accomplished in a laboratory here on Earth. Mm -hmm. So we're going to learn how these large sizes, these fast impact velocities, and also these sort of extraterrestrial asteroid materials respond to deflection. Wow, I mean, there's so much about tonight that we don't know, and it seems like you're fun is just getting started, right, until after impact. So Mallory, Andy, thank you so much. And tonight, ground-based telescopes aren't the only one watching the action. A small cube satellite built by the Italian Space Agency was deployed by DART 15 days ago and has been in the area to give us a bird's eye view of impact. Here's more on Licia Cube. Licia is a six-year CubeSat of the Italian Space Agency participating in the DART mission, and it's also the first Italian satellite operating in deep space. Licia Cube mission objectives is to support DART in the documentation of the impact effects, in particular in terms of the ejecta of materials that will be released from the asteroid surface after the impact, and also imaging the non-visible side of the asteroid during its flyby. LishaCube will acquire uh, images using uh, its two different cameras, uh, Leia, a panchromatic camera, and Duke, an RGB camera. Therefore, we can uh, better understand the nature of the asteroid dimorphous impacted by DART. By means of our uh, scientific operations center in SSTC ASI, we will distribute and process the images in order to make the, uh, them available to the entire team. We are here in Ambrotex Mission Control Center in Turin, from where, together with ASI, we monitor the status of Lichia Cube. The batteries are charged, the radio is communicating correctly, and the navigation aptitude is on the right trajectory. Everything is ready for the most important part of the DART mission, the impact with the asteroid. DART is a global effort to prepare humanity for the unthinkable. Before the spacecraft can complete its mission, the autonomous navigation system must first confirm a lock on target. This is a key milestone that we should be hearing about soon. So let's go back to Samson for the latest for mission operations. Hey, Tahira, we are less than 50 minutes out, and we just heard big news. We have reached the point where SmartNav is now target locked onto Demorphos. Uh, that progress bar should move to your right that much further, closer to impact. Very exciting. Uh, in the meantime, joining me is someone who worked on the instrument playing a starring role with this major milestone and basically all the way up to impact. Lisa Wu, mechanical engineer who helped install the Draco camera and built its cover. Lisa, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. So we just heard <laughs> big news. We hit this target lock. It could have come fairly later than this, but yeah. it is very, it is, we are, we're in a good spot with this target. Exactly. How are you feeling? I am so excited. I'm sure the entire team is ecstatic. This is what we've been working so hard for in these very last moments, and we just heard we got target lock, so could not be feeling any better. Very exciting. I mean, we, we, are, we are humming along. So a quick recap, Smart and have this DART's autonomous navigation system. It's been called the brains of the spacecraft. And right now it's essentially maneuvering that spacecraft on its own, as it will be for the last four hours. Mm -hmm. 
a Draco imager, it's providing SmartNet with that unflinching view of the Morphos about an image per second. It is the eyes of the spacecraft. Lisa, what makes this camera perfect for this mission? Yeah, of course. So the Draco instrument is a very, very high resolution, narrow field of view telescope. Um, the image quality, let's go back. Uh, Draco is a descendant of the Lori telescope, which might sound familiar because it took the very first pictures of Pluto on the New Horizons mission, which also might sound very familiar because that is an APL-led mission. So if you've ever seen the first pictures of Pluto, that is the amazing quality that we have on DART. That's incredible heritage. And yeah, anyone who saw those images of Pluto, those were amazing. And that kind of ups the ante for what we're going to see with these pictures of the Morphos, right? Oh, yeah. So we all know about, a lot of us have smartphones with, you know, cameras. We have mm -hmm. cracks, we have smudges. How did your team make sure that this camera made it in pristine condition to get to this point? Of course. So our flight hardware, including this instrument, was made in the clean room, very, very high, clean facility. Um, in order to make sure that the telescope works, we had to put it through a lot of electrical testing, optical testing, alignment testing. We had to make sure it performs as we intended. And then not only that, you have to take this instrument and put it through all the environments that it will see through space. So we put it through vibration testing, thermal vacuum chamber testing, all to make sure that it performs and it will survive through space. That's amazing. Test, 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 and test again, right? Yes. This is how we get to a stage like this. That is exactly. awesome. Exactly. That is great. Thanks so much, Lisa. The number of astounding technologies that are on board this spacecraft is amazing, but doing the impossible requires nothing less than the astounding, right? Mm -hmm. All right, Tahira, we have the technology. Clearly, we have the talent. Now we wait for history. Back to you. All right, thanks, Samson. It feels good to know that we have locked on target Dimorphos. Now, earlier we asked you to send in your questions by using the hashtag Planetary Defender. And I am joined now by two real life Planetary Defenders. We have Kelly Fast and Lucas Paganini, both from NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office. Let's dive into what you want to know. So, Kelly, Lucas, before I get to social media questions, we actually have a special question from a familiar face, especially if you're into football. So let's take a moment and hear from him. What's up? I'm Joshua Dobbs, quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. Now, I have a question for NASA's start team. On the field, I have to use precision passing in order to get the football in the hands of my teammates. And at least I can see where they are. For NASA's start team, how are you able to aim a spacecraft at an object so far away? You know, that's a really good question, Kelly. And I mean, we haven't really done this before. How can we aim? Right, well, and, but I have to say, Joshua does in a few seconds what we've taken, you know, years <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to do. Um, just as he has to throw it where he knows that the player will be, throw his football where the player will be, Dart needs to end up where uh, Dynamos and Dimorphos will be. And so that, that was learned from uh, astronomy, looking at through telescopes, calculating the orbit, and then the people who launched uh, Dart to its destination navigated there. So it, it's, there's just a lot more calculations involved, which Joshua does in his head. Yeah. And then there's this autonomous second. navigation it would be like he had a football that could navigate itself yeah. and so <laughs> so we, we have that to lean on that, that, that he doesn't and so uh, that's what helps uh, get to that destination all right nice I mean it's very impressive and so we have another question from a from Jonathan on Facebook who wants to know how can a small satellite like dart be able to impact something as big and heavy as an asteroid and actually move it right and it's all about momentum, right? We have this tiny uh, well, asteroid of about 160 meters, the, the size of a football field. And then you have this spacecraft, which is about 500 kilograms. So it's all about momentum, right? We have this massive asteroid and this tiny spacecraft. And how do you move it? It's all about mass and velocity. Since we don't have enough mass in that spacecraft, we have to really impact it hard, and that's why we're impacting it at four miles a second, which is outstanding. <laughs> which is amazing. And I mean, we're actually going to get to watch impact live take place. And so that gets me to my next question. We have Metal Money on Twitter who asks, what is the size of the blast on the asteroid? Kelly, 
Could you explain a little bit about that? Well, and that's something that we're hoping to find out from this mission because, you know, there's there's physics but and uh, calculations, but actually when you're dealing with a real asteroid that we haven't seen close up before and what type of material might be on the surface, uh, what the structure is, this is something that, like a Lucia cube, we hope to see as Lucia cube flies by to see what uh, that blast was, how large it was, which will help those who are doing the modeling of how effective the uh, 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 impact was and in uh, changing the orbit, what all figures in, what Lucas just talked about, the uh, mass and the velocity, but then also maybe that blast mm -hmm. that is seen afterwards, the plume of material that uh, we're hoping to see from Lucia Cube. So how does tonight's mission play into the work that y'all do in NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office, Lucas? Yeah, I would start by saying that this is a very important test. We're mm -hmm. going to know if this kinetic impact is an effective technique to use in the case that there would be any yeah. potential asteroid Fingers on crossed. road to, to Earth. So definitely, for me, that's the most important thing about mm -hmm. this test. But then on top of that, there's uh, finding the asteroids because yeah. you, you can't go out and mitigate a possible threat if you don't even know it's there. And so NASA is very focused also um, on finding near-Earth asteroids with telescopes that survey the skies every night, looking for near-Earth asteroids, getting uh, the orbits calculated, figuring out where they're going to be in the future to see if we even need something by DART, and then working to speed that up. NASA is working on the near-Earth object surveyor space telescope that would look in the infrared and have a different perspective complement the ground-based telescopes to accelerate things just so that we know is there a threat out there that we're facing that we do not yet know about. Wow, I mean it's incredible just to know the work that is already being done. It's good to know that we're building off of it, but it's good to know we've already got some people watching this, guys. Yeah. Um, and so I have our next question from Alan on Twitter who asks, how long does it take for pictures to reach Earth? Well, the uh, the light, the time it takes light and then a radio signal from the spacecraft uh, to come to Earth is 38 seconds. But then there's also the time needed to process the images, so a few more seconds on on, on top of that. So under a minute, but still, it's uh, it, it's it's not instantaneous because it's it's a ways out there. Well, that makes sense. I mean, but under a minute to get something back from space, I'd say we're doing pretty good right there. Mm -hmm. right. So Lucas Kelly, thank you so much for everything that y'all are doing to keep our planet safe. Thanks, Sahir. And so it's important to note that tonight we're attempting something that's never been done. And with that presents many challenges to overcome. Here's what makes DART a first of its kind mission. The DART mission is a very difficult mission because we are trying to do something that hasn't been done before. This is the first time we're going to an asteroid that is this small the start and we're actually going to attempt an impact. The DART mission is really something that the whole world can get behind. We're doing this mission to prove that we can deflect an asteroid if we find one that is on an impact course for Earth. We are trying to hit an asteroid 163 meters wide, which is about the size of the Washington Monument while flying at six kilometers per second, which is like going from New York to D.C. in about a minute. There is no chance that this asteroid could ever hit Earth. It's a very small asteroid. It's only about the size of a small football stadium, and it's almost uh, seven million miles away from the Earth. That's uh, 28 times the distance between the Earth and the Moon. There's kind of a limit on how much mass you can launch in space. You know, rockets are only so big. Uh, so our spacecraft is only the size of a golf cart. Draco is the uh, primary instrument on the DART spacecraft. It is the camera that is going to be imaging the Didymos system as we approach. When we first see the asteroid through Draco, uh, it's just going to look like a pixel. There's a star tracker on board that takes images of the stars and compares them to a known catalog to determine which way it's pointing in space. It poses the biggest risk because very, very small errors in this measurement can spell the difference between success and failure. And those measurements are going to be fed into the SmartNav algorithm that's going to be making the autonomous course correction uh, commands that will put us on an intercept course. There is a very small probability that we don't hit the asteroid. Even if we do everything right, um, our sensors work well, our spacecraft is doing well, we are looking, we're finding the asteroid, even then, 
we might still miss. We're trying to teach a computer how to recognize an object we've never seen before. And the way it does that is by taking pictures of the asteroid and then interpreting where it is in space and guiding itself to it. The spacecraft is controlling itself. SmartNav is guiding the spacecraft and we have very limited ability to respond in that time so it has to do it all by itself. And at about two and a half minutes out we cease all maneuvering and we coast until we hit the asteroid. It is going very very fast towards the asteroid traveling at six kilometers per second. 200 times faster than a car on the freeway. So when we hit all of that mass, all of that momentum pushes the asteroid. Even giving it a small nudge will allow it to change its course. But if we did see an asteroid on track for Earth, this would be enough of a deflection. It's like a bittersweet moment. Yeah, all this hard work just got destroyed, but that was exactly why we put it all together. Of all the endeavors that we do for space and in space, this is probably uh, one of the ones that uh, one day will be the most important thing that uh, we've ever done. In the future, I hope that DART can teach us what ways work and what ways don't work for planetary defense. Because it is humankind's uh, first demonstration that we have gained the knowledge and the technology to be able to protect the Earth uh, from uh, an asteroid impact. Space exploration is rooted in pushing past boundaries. Remember, tonight is a test and we hope to make impact. Now that you've learned of the challenges today's test, let's head back to mission operations and get a status update on DART's real-time progress. Samson, how are we looking? Hey, Tahira, we have 30 minutes to go until impact. As we heard earlier, so far so good. SmartNav is now targeting Dimorphos. Thrusters are firing, maneuvering the spacecraft. Draco, Dart's eye, playing paparazzi with Dimorphos, providing SmartNav with about an image per second. And this is a good time to remind you that what we're seeing on the Draco feed is delayed by about 45 seconds on account of signal delay and image processing. And coming up, we're about to see the team conduct a final poll, one last scheduled confab to make sure that all systems are go. And as we head to that, I have someone with me who knows a thing or two about ensuring spacecraft readiness and integrity. Betsy Congdon, DART's mechanical systems engineer. Betsy, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. So you led the team that literally put DART together, is that right, Betsy? Yeah, so the, my job is to make sure the engineers and the technicians all physically put all these boxes that you've been hearing, bolts and all, all onto a spacecraft all together. i got to ask, with a mission so ambitious, how many hours, how many years, how many people? Do you have any idea at this point? Oh, man. So, I mean, DART has been thought about for a long time, but really started in earnest about five years ago. We started building up the spacecraft and, you know, in that assembly that I was talking about about two, two and a half years ago. Um, and so it's been hundreds of hours, you know, to make something like this possible. People with all sorts of talents. You've seen a lot of them uh, today. That's incredible. And so we're heading up toward another status update, as I said earlier. And as we all know, space is a unique and challenging environment. When you're assembling DART, what were the key boxes you were checking off of that very long quality assurance list to get the spacecraft to where it is right now and hopefully till impact? So space is very hard, and so what we do is each individual component, Lisa was talking about this earlier, goes through its own individual testing, and then we put the whole spacecraft together, and we will check out the electrical systems, making sure all the boxes are working and talking to each other. We put it into a vacuum chamber, make sure it's going to work in space, put it through all the different temperatures it's going to see, and then put it on a shaker table and actually uh, mimic launch, and so it actually goes through all of that as a full spacecraft as well as individual components. So we go through a lot of testing, mission operations, uh, mission simulations to get to this point. That's incredible. I mean, I don't know if you included, you, you mentioned so much, Ray. Is that also accounting for the temperature fluctuations in space? That's another key part. Yeah, so the um, we have chambers here at APL that are specially built to take these spacecraft, put them into the vacuum of space, and run them through the temperature spaces that we're going to actually see. That's incredible. How many times do you check? Is it like one test and we're done, or are you sometimes <laughs> testing and testing? Lots and lots of testing, and that's what makes it, you know, so perfect. We're seeing these great images coming in uh, because of all that testing and all that work. So, you know, you don't do anything once. You're doing it many times because once it's in space, there's not a lot of ways to fix it. 
Right. Well, do you ever, you know, think about that one panel, that one component that gave you a little bit of heartburn in the clean room, and you're up at night thinking, I think that thing is going to hold true up until the end? Everything, <laughs> everything is looking really good, I will say. You know, we had a lot of new technologies, which were really exciting. The Rosa Solar Rays had never been integrated onto a spacecraft before. And so that was like a challenge, but one the team was up for, and now it's all ready and working perfectly. All these new technology demonstrations, I mean, it only adds to the complexity of this mission and to, you know, testing things, I wouldn't say even more so, but it's, it's just as critical. The new technology, everything has to be so to make sure it comes yeah, I mean, all of this new technology just requires extra testing, but that just gains confidence. You know, you're seeing the team working through that, working through all these mission sims. So um, that's really what makes it exciting. You don't want to just do the same thing over and over. This is what makes APL a special place. We build these special spacecraft that, you know, have never been done before. The last quick question for you. It's got to be a little bittersweet that a spacecraft you poured heart and soul into is about to careen into an asteroid. How, how are you feeling about that? I'm feeling great about it. You know, it was designed to careen into the asteroid. It's, it's meeting its destiny. So it's really exciting to see, um, and I can't wait for impact. Well, it is serving a purpose. I guess that's why it's easier to let it go. Right? Exactly, so very much so. That is awesome. Well, I think we are about to get into that final poll in the mock um, very shortly. So we're going to hear that final 30 minute poll, and then we're going to hear from Lena Adams again, Dart's mission systems engineer, to give us that summary of what we just heard, how she's feeling, how they're feeling in there. Uh, very exciting stuff. This will be the final poll of the evening. We are awaiting that final poll. This is Dart MSC on DT Mock. It is time for the last status poll. Yes. We're about, what, 7,000 miles from Dimorphos at this point? So, yay. All right. Um, image quality. How are we doing? Still looking. Very good. Uh, Dimorphos still tracking along that same brightness predict as Didymos. That's great. All right. Maneuver complete. <laughs> yes, thank you. All right. <laughs> uh, SmartNav. SmartNav is looking nominal. We are at under 30 meters of projected mist distance right yeah, now. Yeah, it's looking really good. Look at that. That's that's looking fantastic. Very excited. All right, uh, GNC. Yeah, GNC also looking good. We've we've been very excited to do those burns. So <laughs> we've been waiting a long time. Oh, this is great. Autonomy. Autonomy is green. The heaters are cycling nominally, and we've had no new uh, fault rules firing. Okay, wonderful. DSN. DSN is green, and ESA is green. Got plenty of margin. Looks good. All right, ground systems. Ground system has been helping a few users manage clients, but everything is going fine there, and we are green. Yes, wonderful. Thank you, guys completes the poll. Um, last one, last one. All right, so Didymos is looking like itself. We'll see what Dimorphos is looking like soon. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to transition to precision lock at 20 minutes. That's our next milestone. So thanks all. All right, we're about to hear from Lena Adams from the Mission Operations Center. Hi, Samson. Hi, Lena. That sounded very positive. 
How's it going in there? Oh, it's going great. It's going great. We've locked on uh, Dimorphos. We are maneuvering towards it, and uh, yeah, everything is looking really good. We are. Um, we were at the time of the poll within just a few meters of projected miss distance, which means we were hitting uh, towards the center. And at this point, we're you know coming back there about 30 meters off the center of the lit portion of Dimorphos as of right now. We've executed two burns and everything's looking on track. Oh, that sounds wonderful, Lena. Thanks so much for that, and good luck on the final stretch. Thank you, thank you. Have a good one. All right, Betsy, we had that very positive poll, lots of fantastics, lots of clapping. We heard Lena in a very positive mood. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. It's amazing to see, like, the actual dots on the screen for real coming down from the spacecraft. Very exciting. Any any words of encouragement for the team? I mean, obviously, they're doing a great job. They've practiced a ton, and uh, we're ready. Go DART. You've heard it all loud and clear, Tahira. All systems are going. We remain on track for impact. And like Betsy just said, go DART. Back to you. All right. What an exciting update, Samson. You just heard it. All systems are go. Mission operations confirm the spacecraft is on track for impact. But in order to hit the mark, the test must first locate its target. That's why Johns Hopkins APL engineer Michelle Chen helped develop new autonomous navigation techniques that will ensure a bullseye. Let's take a look. Never in my life would I have thought I would take a couple hundred million dollar spacecraft and crash it into an asteroid. <laughs> My name is Michelle Chen, and I lead the team that is responsible for the autonomous navigation of DART spacecraft to hit an asteroid. The DART mission is the first planetary defense test mission. Our goal is to hit and impact an asteroid to understand and study the momentum transfer so that we could potentially later down the road, if we need to, deflect an asteroid on its way to Earth. I am the Smart Nav lead. Smart Nav stands for Small Body Maneuvering Autonomous Real-Time Navigation. Smart Nav, I always consider it sort of like the brains. And so the camera, Draco, is essentially the eyes. The algorithm has to identify and hit the target in the field of view of the camera. We're flying at over six kilometers a second. It essentially occupies a pixel up until possibly 30 minutes prior to impact. And then that's where everything gets really exciting. And so you could just imagine if it was a human being joysticking this. Because we don't know for sure what the asteroids look like, our simulation gives us the capability to use different asteroid shapes and asteroid objects to see that our smart nav algorithm performs against all these unknowns. We're super excited and nervous as well. I love pushing the boundaries and I love the application of math into real world problems, you know, and then seeing it actually doing its thing. To me, there's nothing cooler than that. If you're just joining us, we're about 24 minutes away from DART's impact with asteroid Dimorphos. The spacecraft is flying at four miles per second, guided only by its autonomous navigation system. I'm here now with Tom Statler, DART program scientist, and Don Graninger, DART impact modeler. Tom, Don, thank you for being here with us tonight. We have some good news happening, but we did just hear about the challenges that DART is facing tonight. So, Don, could you tell us a little bit about what kind of uncertainty exists with a mission like this? Yeah, sure. So what's really interesting is that until just, you know, even a few minutes ago, I feel like we're just getting our first looks at yeah. Dimorphos. And so we have absolutely no idea what we're going to be impacting into. It could be covered in rubble pile. It could be just a completely different shape. We don't know until we really write up on that impact. And that's probably one of our biggest uncertainty. On this. I mean, but that's what really makes tonight so exciting. And so, Tom, could you expand a little bit more on how we will use this information in the future if all goes successfully? Well, this test is really important to understand how we might be able to deflect asteroids in the future. And when we, when we measure the change in the binary period of Dimorphos, and we will understand how the asteroid reacted to our kinetic impact. And then as we get deeper understanding into exactly what the geology was of that asteroid, that's the basic information that's going to help us refine our physics understanding of asteroids and our ability to compute and predict, like Don does, runs these fantastic codes and extend this knowledge to really have a, a, a good plan for how we might react if we ever do discover a dangerous asteroid that is different from Dimorphos. 
Well, hey, I mean, it's better to be safe than sorry. So <laughs> it sounds like y'all's party is really just getting started after impact. So congratulations on your success so far. It has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Now, any second, we should be learning if DART has a precision lock on its target dimorphos. This is a key milestone critical to Tignite success. Samson, mission operations must be buzzing. How are things going? Hey, Tahira. The energy is indeed electric, and the team is hyper-focused. You could hear a pin drop right now as we're coming up on the critical 20-minute mark from impact and expecting to hear from the team that SmartNav is now precision locked onto Demorphos, which means that SmartNav will be tracking only Demorphos from here on out. Why? SmartNav has, Smart has full confidence that we are in fact tracking Demorphos, and so we want to remove any confusion by continuing to track Didymos. Because what could happen with Didymos is that its shape could be such that there's a lot of shadowing, which could make it seem in the Draco imagery like multiple blobs, as the team likes to call them. And we don't want SmartNav to mistake any of those blobs for Dimorphos, so we're doing away with tracking Didymos altogether. We are waiting for that announcement as of precision lock. Um, all right, we're about to hear from the team. Actually, we have some time until we hear that. And now let's listen in for that confirmation of precision lock. All right, we expect to be in precision lock soon. We are waiting for confirmation of precision lock. MSC, this is SN5. Go ahead, SN5. We are precision locked and still tracking Dimorphos. Yes. So I'm going to hear again oh, from Elena right. Adams. Um, this is great. Um, this is Dart MSC on DT Mach. So this was our last milestone. At this point, we're going to be uh, working towards Demorphos. I expect we're going to do some burns. We're about 4,500 miles away from Didymos and Demorphos. So let's see what happens. Ground soft 4 one FC2. Please. Right, joining me now to react to that bit of good news is Lindley Johnson, NASA's planetary defense officer. Lindley, you heard Lena. We are now precision locked. A lot of applause. Things are looking good. And we are now headed for the moment of truth. How are you holding up? Oh, I'm doing great. Uh, you know, the team's been doing great. The spacecraft's doing great. Uh, it's uh, This precision lock, you know, is, is absolute... Uh, milestone for the terminal phase here. We've got a good signature on Dimorphos, uh, so the spacecraft has what it needs to guide itself in uh, for the impact uh, here in uh, 17, almost 18, 18 minutes. So we're doing great. Yeah, so close. Um, very exciting moments ahead. Now, we can't say this enough, and I know you've said it so many times, but it's worth repeating for viewers that Dimorphos is not a threat to Earth nor will it be after impact, right? No, that's right. Uh, uh, this uh, asteroid system is still almost 7 million miles away from the Earth. Uh, it's at its closest point in the orbit right now to Earth. So from the, this point forward, it's going to be moving away uh, from Earth. So there's no chance of uh, uh, anything, uh, anything here. 
we've got to look for all the other unknown asteroids out there still awesome. uh, to find what the uh, hazard really is. Thanks so much, Lindley. I'll catch you on the other side of impact. Oh, okay, yeah, if you can. <laughs> Back to you, Tierra. All right, thanks, Samson. It is amazing to know that we have a precision lock on target dimorphos. Now, we have a fun way for you to join our mission, and it is by signing up to be a planetary defender. Visit bity.com forward slash planetary defender. Take the quiz and receive a certificate like this one. Now, once it's official, show us on social media using the hashtag Planetary Defender. Now, telescopes from around the world are observing tonight's impact to ensure that how successful we are at changing the asteroid's orbit. They'll be measuring this success. And you may be wondering, how does that happen? Let's go behind the scenes with astronomer Nick Moskovitz at Lowell Observatory, home to the telescope that discovered Pluto, to see what's in store for DART. This is Lowell Observatory. Lowell is one of many observatories around the world that will be observing the DART impact, NASA's first ever planetary impact can deflect an asteroid in its orbit. This is where Pluto was discovered, and we are still doing research in all areas of astronomy today. So let's go check it out. This is the Pluto telescope, the telescope that was used to discover Pluto almost 100 years ago. So here we are at the Clark Telescope. This is where Percival Lowell's at to observe Mars. Let's head on over to the Lowell Discovery Telescope, about an hour south of Flagstaff, which is where we are going to be collecting data for the DART mission. The reason we're all the way out here, in the middle of this forest, is that we have really dark skies here. And this is the Lowell Discovery Telescope. This is what a 4.3 meter telescope looks like. This is what we will be using to study Didymos and Dimorphos in the days and weeks after DART impact. The DART spacecraft will be hitting an asteroid called Dimorphos, a special because it's a binary asteroid, which means a satellite around a larger asteroid called Didymos. And DART will actually be hitting Dimorphos. And what we will be measuring is how much DART changes the orbit of Dimorphos around Didymos. So this is an important test for planetary defense mitigation strategies in case we ever have to do this for real. The Lowell Discovery Telescope is one of many telescopes around the world which will be used to study Didymos and Dimorphos. It's really a global coordinated effort. And what we're looking at here is a large 4.3 meter primary mirror that's in the middle of the telescope tube here. Up at the top is a secondary mirror. The secondary mirror up top there is what is focusing the light down onto the instruments and allows us to take images with the camera that's located down at the bottom. This is maybe one of my favorite hidden rooms at the telescope. We're like standing inside the telescope. Underneath the telescope, 100 tons above your head. Held up by this and this, which is cool. It's sort of, as you can see, the, the highest peak around here. Uh, just over 8,000 feet. You come up here for sunset. It's, you know, sun setting right there. It's, it's perfect. For DART, we're going to be collecting images of the night sky. And typically, an observer would be here in front of one of these consoles controlling the instrument and taking images like these as they're coming in off the telescope. DART is really a sort of before and after experiment. We need to understand the system before the spacecraft intentionally impacts, and then we have to understand what the outcome of that impact event is. As we watch from the Earth, Dimorphos will pass in front of Didymos and behind Didymos. What we will be doing with those images is measuring the brightness of Didymos in those images and looking at how that brightness changes. And those dips in brightness allow us to measure when uh, these eclipses happen and measure the orbit period of Dimorphos. And so you have essentially a fixed star field here. All the white dots are stars of different brightness. And moving through this field is Didymos and Dimorphos, which again, we can't distinguish them as discrete points of light, but we have that small object moving through the field of view. So after impact, we will then be able to go back and start observing intensely, looking for those mutual events, you know, those eclipse events of Dimorphos passing in front of and behind Didymos. And on each one of these frames, we're measuring the brightness to assess whether or not it's undergoing one of these events where Dimorphos is passing in front of or behind, and using those to determine the orbit period of Dimorphos around Didymos. 
This is such a cool experiment. It's such a singular experiment. Using the ground-based telescopes like this one and others around the world to, to watch the system and see how it's affected by this impact event because that's really what's going to give us the answer to what did DART do at the time of impact. And that will be exciting to see how that evolves over the days and weeks following that impact. All right. After a 10-month, 470-million-mile journey, DART is just minutes away from making history. A truly global effort, this mission has brought together people from around the world, united under one goal, to find a way to protect humanity from a hazardous asteroid if one were ever discovered. Now, usually NASA spacecraft are intended to operate for many years or even decades, but not DART. DART was built to be destroyed. DART is a mission of firsts, proving that a spacecraft can autonomously seek, find, and approach a target in space that's so far away, we don't even know what it looks like. It also marks the first time humanity will have moved a planetary body in the universe. I said that correctly. Now, at this point, the spacecraft is controlling itself, making small maneuvers to ensure it's lined up with its target. DART is speeding through space and will cover the last four miles of its journey in just one second. Coming up, we'll hear the final updates from mission operators and witness the big moment live from space. Samson, you have the best seat in the house. How are we looking? You're right, Tahira. Front row tickets to the biggest event in town, and things are looking good. We are T minus 10 minutes to impact, and DART is precision locked onto Dimorphos and zooming down the home stretch. Now, we have a lot to cover in the time we have left, and I'm thrilled to have with me Lori Glaze, director of NASA's Planetary Science Division, with me for the ride. Lori, such a pleasure to have you. Oh my gosh, I am so excited to be here and really happy that we are here in this final 10 minutes. We are almost there. While you are just in the thick of it with the team up until a few minutes ago, what is the atmosphere like in there? I can only imagine. It's, it's really, it, it's great. I mean, they're excited. Um, every time there's a marker that we, we meet a milestone, everyone is cheering and very excited. But there's also almost a sense of a calm confidence that with every milestone, everything's going you know, as planned. Uh, we've we're found and we locked on the, the target as planned, pretty much at the right time. Uh, they're looking at the brightness and the reflectivity of the object, and, and it's more or less what they expected. Um, everything is performing as expected, and so there's a lot of cheering and happiness, but just kind of a sense, hey, you know, we've been planning for this a long time, and we've got it. We've got this. We've been planning for this. We can hear applause left and right throughout this evening, all good signs. What are they focused on at this critical juncture, Lori? It is basically years of planning, 10 months of making sure we get to this point after launch, and they've been juggling a lot. Is there anything in particular that they are glued on as we enter this moment of truth? Yeah, so the main thing they've been watching is you know, getting to that point where we could do the precision lock, where we had good enough signal coming back and enough confidence in where we are relative to dimorphous that we could really do that precision lock onto the target and we hands off now right we're not you know the the spacecraft is going to drive itself and really focused on that uh you know that point where they could be uh precision locked and they're also thinking about looking at and reassessing continuously what's the probability of miss right mm -hmm. as you get closer and closer that probability should get smaller and smaller and it is it's getting, it looks really, really good right now. Well, it sounds like the game of thinking, of wondering, really doesn't end until that last second comes to pass. So they can do a lot of great up until this point. We just have to see this through to these last few minutes. Well, and in a few minutes, speaking of that, all the years of thinking, of doing, planning, reacting is finally coming to an end. From five minutes to impact, there will be no more opportunity to send any commands to SmartNav in the Mission Operations Center. The team will be purely spectators, the data coming in, and they are just wetting it out like the rest of us for the first time. Lori, this is huge both from an operational perspective and also an emotional one, isn't it? 
Yeah, it is. I mean, you can imagine, um, you know, I've you know, been, I'm really excited about it, and I've been engaged with this mission for, you know, the last four and a half years that I've been in my current role. But this team has been working so hard on this for so many years, and they've put so much of their energy and their time into this and so much planning and rehearsing. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a really big event for them to, like you say, just counting down and watching at this point there's not much else they can do but watch and see the fruits of all their work yeah I've gotten to know many members of this team over the past few months and you know there's a lot of alpha individuals on there <laughs> right you need a good mix of alpha people to make sure we get to this point I can imagine I can only imagine what they're feeling perhaps like you said a little bit of relief a little bit of can I let this go I have worked for this moment so long and now we can no longer do anything that moment is just coming up yeah, but I think they're ready. I think they're they're at that point. You know, I was you're you're getting some shots of Elena Adams, the uh, the systems engineer, and you can see the excitement in her voice. She's so ready to to show the success of this mission. This is awesome. Five minutes out, which we're coming up on now. The team will be hands off two and a half minutes from impact. SmartNav, which has been guiding the spacecraft autonomously for four hours, will also step away, stop any maneuvers. DART will simply be coasting to its fate. This is blockbuster stuff, Lori. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we are there. Yeah. And I have front row tickets, and we are very soon about to open up these airwaves in the Mission Operations Center. We'll stay plugged in all the way through impact. Remember, at this point, five minutes out, no more commands to SmartNav will be possible. The team is watching it just like you and me and the rest of us. All right, we've reached five minutes from impact. The final command opportunity to SmartNav has passed, and the team is simply watching that data stream in just like we are. Also remember, there is a 30-second, 30 38-second lag for the data to travel to Earth, and also an additional few more seconds for image processing. It's important to note that. You should be hearing the chatter in the Mission Operations Center momentarily. This is DART MSC on DTMOG. Five minutes till impact. Five minutes till impact. We are at 1,100 miles away. <laughs> also, our window for sending any commands to the spacecraft is done. <laughs> Contingencies done. <laughs> this is a great vibe in that mission right. operations center right now, Lori. It really Ooh. is. Um, they are so excited. And this is the investigation you know, I, on DT I'm honing in looking at these images as we get closer and closer, and you look at Didymos, and just you're starting to see the this physical body appear there. It's incredible. Just incredible. That great. I'm still having a hard time believing this is real energy coming in near real time. Yeah, yeah, yeah but you've been watching it over the Four last you know, 30, 45 minutes go from just being a collection of individual pixels and now you can actually see the shape and the, the shading and texture of, of Didymos and we're going to see that same thing with Dimorphos as we get closer and closer. This is so cool. Never We're before seen images of the Morphos will be come into stark relief. Absolutely. A few seconds before impact. Didymos. It's amazing. Yeah. All right. The team is standing just recognizing this moment years in the making. It is really nice to see them relax a little bit, get off from those computers that they've been glued to and just appreciate this moment that's coming. Yeah, and they've earned this. Um, it's just great to see them there. This is so cool. Lori, we hit another major milestone. We are now two minutes and a half from impact, and SmartNav has stopped maneuvering the spacecraft. 
dart is now coasting toward Dimorphos, and we hope into the history books. Absolutely. This will be, I'm sure you've heard it many times tonight, uh, humanity's first ever, ever attempt at trying to move another celestial body, and also our first attempt ever to execute a, uh, a mission in the you know, sole purpose of planetary defense. So what an exciting, exciting time. Yeah, and I'm starting to see Dimorphos start to come into view there. You can see it starting to take shape. I'm starting to see individual boulders on Didymos. Um, unbelievable, unbelievable clarity of images there. We're coasting on in. Our projected miss distance is going to be about 17 meters. All right. All honors on this event, space telescopes, ground telescopes from every continent on Earth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Alright. Two minutes out. Does not look like one single rock to me. Oh boy, we're getting close. Fourteen thousand miles per hour, Lori. Fourteen thousand miles per hour and remember, you know, uh forty five minutes ago, fifty five minutes ago we couldn't even resolve this this object in space and now we are you can see us zeroing in right on target. And we're now dropping the clock and we'll go by loss of signal to confirm impact. Right. Yes. Imagine we'll get that loss of signal and then we'll hear from Lena Adams again, um, letting us know that we've like been we'll successful. Know. I feel like that'll be a crystal clear <laughs> signal. I think so. I think we're starting to see more uh, more resolution. In fact, look at that. Didymos has even gone out of the view. We're now just seeing Dimorphos. This is remarkable stuff. Oh my goodness, look at that. Looks like control system settling down. Angular rates look really good. I think we're going to get the investigation team some good pictures. Wow. No, no, come on. We can do better than that. <laughs> Starting to see those individual boulders there. We can see shadows uh, of various rocks on the surface. Impact. It's amazing, guys. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. Unbelievable. Yeah. Looks to me like we're headed straight in. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh my goodness, Eight, yeah. seven, oh, six, wow. five, four, three, two, one. Oh my gosh. <gasps> oh wow. Awaiting visual confirmation. All right. Let's see. We got it? Waiting. Waiting. And we have an impact. <laughs> we try and be for humanity in the name of planetary defense. Woo. Fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Oh. What, what a moment. Very few words can really capture this moment. This is beautiful to watch. Amazing. What a team. Is, what, what a team and a what an accomplishment. Team. A few weeks ago, they had their last dress rehearsal. They were getting emotional at the dress rehearsal. And they're like, this is this is crazy. We're getting emotional. This is not the real thing. I can only imagine what they are feeling <laughs> right now. Yes. Well, you can see them there on screen. They're all pretty excited. Wow. Hearing impact, the curtains close on Draco feed. That raw joy from the team, years of hard work and the weight of expectation lifted off their shoulders. This is, this is amazing. Fantastic. This is beautiful. And Lori, really, yeah. this is a huge moment for the mission. Lots more work needs to happen in the days of Absolutely. Months. Now, you know, as I always say, it's one of my favorite missions. Now is when the science starts. It just starts now. Now that we've uh, impacted, now we're going to see for real how effective we were. We're going to train all of those ground-based 
telescopes um, on the Didymos dimorphous system, and we're going to make measurements that will help us uh, determine just how what its orbit looks like now relative to what it was before. So it's going to be great. Very cool. All right, this is when science, engineering, and a great purpose, planetary defense, come together and... You know, it makes a magical moment like this. Yeah, really. absolutely. And you can see so many people there that have made this happen. Uh, the team of APL engineers um, that have really poured their souls into this mission. Laurie, any last words to mark this historic moment? Oh, we're, we're embarking on a new era of humankind, um, an era in which we potentially have the capability to protect ourselves from something like a dangerous, hazardous asteroid impact. What an amazing thing. We've never had that capability before. Thank you so much, Lori. Those are poignant last words. Tahira, history has been made. Back to you. Wow. I mean, what an exciting day for the DART team. And in in case you're keeping score, humanity won, asteroids zero. Now, I'm here with Nancy Chabot, DART coordination lead. Nancy, talk about a moment to catch on camera. What is going through your head right now? I mean, I'm just thinking, wow, that was amazing, wasn't yeah. it? I mean, those images, you just got closer and closer, and sort of we've been planning for this moment. We've been talking about it for years at APL here. We've been working on this since 2015. And I knew, <laughs> I've been talking, this is the images that we're going to see, and they're going to be spectacular. And I think even then they exceeded my expectations of just zooming in like that. And, uh, you know, it really is just such the team accomplishment and to get to this moment over so many years. And I don't have to talk about it as coming anymore. It's happened now. We have done this. It's happened, and it is just incredible that as humans, like, we have done this. We did this. And, Nancy, do you have anything you'd like to t say to the teams who made tonight possible? Oh, I mean, I don't need to say anything to the teams because I know everybody like me is really proud to be part of this, right? Proud of this thing that we've been working on for years, you know, and even before 2015, internationally, people wanted to do this. People yeah. wanted to take this first test. And then we finally did partners across the United States. We have actually uh, 28 countries represented on our investigation team of scientists, telescopes on all seven continents, everybody doing their part to make this moment happen. Um, I know I'm a... I'm really honored to be on this team, and I know other people on the team feel the same way. As you should, Nancy. And I mean, there's a lot to celebrate here tonight. And so now that we have come.